Welcome to something new we're trying here at Fresh Cap called The Mushroom Show. I wanted to leave some room to have some kind of longer one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who are really the movers and the shakers in the world of mushrooms. So many things are happening in mushrooms right now from culinary aspects to mental health aspects and everywhere in between. And I think it's really important to be able to have those conversations and just explore the wider world of mushrooms with some really cool people. So I'm super excited about the show. This is episode one of The Mushroom Show where we are talking to none other but Eugenia Bone. She is a nature and food journalist, an author, a speaker, and a cultural pillar in the world of mushrooms. As you'll find out in the interview, Eugenia originally became involved in the world of mushrooms through her upbringing. She has a particularly deep appreciation for mushrooms and their culinary applications, but she also has a passion for mushrooms in all sorts of other capacities. Now you might already know Eugenia Bone. She appears in the wildly famous film Fantastic Fungi, which was on Netflix last summer, a movie which celebrates fungi's ability to connect and to heal. Her books intersect ecology, mycology, sustainability, and of course, food. She also performs lectures in venues across America on the potential healing benefits of psilocybin mushrooms. We are super excited to have Eugenia Bone on this, the inaugural episode of The Mushroom Show. Of course, this is a pretty long interview, so if you want to skip to any sections that you're particularly interested in, make sure you check out the timestamps in the description below. And other than that, let's jump right into the interview with Eugenia. Eugenia Bone. Let's get started. Eugenia Bone, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I'm glad to be here. So the first thing I want to talk about is you wrote Mycophilia, and you wrote that in 2001. And, you know, since then, mushrooms have like absolutely exploded in popularity, probably in part to the book you wrote, but also a lot of other things going in the space. But what I wanted to learn was, first of all, like what fascinated you so much about mushrooms to be such an early adopter? Um, well, I came out of a, um, a food career. Um, I was, well, first let me back up. So Mycophilia, I think it came out in 2011, um, not 2001. So that's, so it's, I'm not, it's not that, <laughs> it's pretty old though. Um, so it's about 10 years old. And so, but way before that I had been writing about, um, uh, about foraging, foraged foods, wild foods. That was like one of the things that I was very excited about from a culinary perspective and also from, um, just my own personal background. I'm Italian American. We never did things like, um, uh, I don't know, go sailing and stuff, you know, play golf or whatever. We uh, forage for food as a family activity. And so I suppose that um, the I had I caught the bug early on. Um, but in order to find wild mushrooms, uh, and so I, I've hunted different kinds of ways, you know, hunted for birds, hunted for boar even, but um, I really loved wild mushroom hunting. I liked uh I like finding things that hide versus chasing things that flee. And um, so I, in order to find things that hide, in order to find those wild mushrooms, I had to learn a little bit about uh, their, the, why they grew where they grew. And so I joined the New York Mycological Society and be, started attending some lectures and, you know, all with the purpose of finding wild mushrooms. But inevitably, um, the um, mycology started to fascinate me more and more and more. Um, so combined with a realization that I could do like travel foraging, that I could go to a place like the Sierra Nevadas and hunt for burn morels in May and then hunt porcini in August in the Rockies, um, that combined with my growing interest in the science is what led me to write a book and it's been one of the major fascinations of my career and personal life, too, for that matter. Yeah, and the book is, is really great. I'm glad you corrected me. I, I misspoke. I, I knew it was 2011. I might have said 2001. But still, uh, you know, 10 years since the book has come out. And, you know, I read this book basically as, as soon as it came out. And it was a super big inspiration for me as well That's to right. go travel. Because part of the story in the book, you talk about it, it's kind of a journey, right? Because at the start of the book, it's almost like you're aware of mushrooms and aware of all the cool things. But, like, it's really a story of you learning stuff along the way and sharing your experiences, which I think is really cool and a lot of people can relate to. But 
you know, since it's been 10 years since it's been published, is there anything um, now, like, how do you feel about the book now? Do you feel um, different now that the, the world of mushrooms is, you know, really exploded in popular culture? Is there anything in the book that you think differently about now? Uh, what do you think about it 10 years later? Well, I mean, I would love to do a, you know, a, a sort of part two for, because I've traveled to many more places. Like, you know, I didn't, Get a ch it was after I wrote Mycophilia that I went to hunt Cordyceps cynisis um, in Tibet, for example. I mean, what wow. an incredible um, organism and all the anthropology around its collection is also extremely fascinating. Plus, as a nature writer, the um, Himalayas are, are pretty awesome. Um, so there's a lot of things I would like to, I mean, I, I can't say I would want to change. Like, it's not like Mycophilia has errors that make me crazy. I mean, there's not. probably a few yeah. little things, but I've forgotten them. <laughs> so it's incredible <laughs> how you get over stuff if enough time passes. Um, but I certainly would love to expand on some of the subjects in the book because there's been more science coming in or because I've traveled more. Um, also, because there's the community has grown, um, there's more people to talk about, more personalities, more characters. So all I can say is, you know, if I could keep writing it, <laughs> that would be great. That's my only um, sadness. Otherwise, you know, the book is, is um, I think it stands on its own pretty strong. It's still pretty strong. I mean, some of the facts are kind of old, like statistics about how many mushrooms people eat, you know, things <laughs> like that. Um, a year, you know, those sort of statistical things from that I grabbed from the USDA website and so on. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's all, you know, it's pretty factually correct. I mean, there's so much new stuff on endophytic fungi. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to have done a whole chapter on that, but it was just really new to me at the time. And the science was actually relatively new too. So there's a lot of cool things that have, have come up since then um, that anybody who's following the literature, I'm sure, is aware of. Yeah, and I agree. It's a fantastic book. And anybody who's watching this, if you haven't read it, again, it's called My Mycophilia. It's a, a it's a really it's a big book, too, actually, when you compare it to a lot of the, the mushroom popular popular books out there. This one is, you know, it's big. It's it's really deep and there's a lot of stories in there. So. Um, Thanks. But there is a lot more stuff coming out about mushrooms. And I wanted to talk specifically about fantastic fungi, which I know you were a part of. You were mm -hmm. in that documentary. Um, obviously, that has had a huge impact on, on the mushroom space. You know, it was in the works for a number of years, but this summer it finally appeared on Netflix. And that's where yeah. you know, things really started to explode. And I wanted to get your opinion. Like, how did you think that film turned out? Um, were you happy with the way it turned out? And, you know, what are your thoughts on, on the result of fantastic fungi? Well, first of all, I'm thrilled that it's turned people on to mushrooms because people that are turned on to mushrooms are turned on to ecology. And people that are turned on to ecology, you know, feel a sense, hopefully, uh, I think, uh, a sense of responsibility toward um, each other and to the other organisms we share the planet with. So that's that's all good. <laughs> you know, that's the number one thing. Um, fantastic fungi is, I th I sort of see it as charting Louis. Um, journey learning about mushrooms, just like mycophilia in a way charts my journey. Mine was through foraging. Uh, Louis was through these various um, people um, who uh, really influenced him, like Paul Stamets. Um, but Louis' fascinations and his um, curiosities uh, is what really what shaped that film. So, you know, I was. A, you know, I'm a friend of his and he had read Mycophilia and wanted some, and we would have these long phone conversations like, how do you make a movie about kingdom fungi? It's so huge. It's like saying, I'm going to do a film about plants. <laughs> now it's not easy. Right. Um, but uh, um, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled with the film because it's like changing minds and hearts um, in terms of its content. It's Louis' journey, and that's to me what you know is it makes it also so intimate and um, and really uh, you know personal, sincere, um, even. Yeah, it it did an absolutely amazing job, you know, bringing mushrooms to the main stage, and the amount of interest in mushrooms from that film has been pretty surprising. And like for guys like me who've been interested in mushrooms my whole life, you see the film, you're like, oh, that's really cool. But to see all of these new people just absolutely fascinated by that film and and willing to go deeper. And 
I was going to ask, you know, what you think the ramifications are of such a popular expose on mushrooms. You already kind of explained like, you know, getting people to think more about how, you know, the wider implications for our planet. But is, you know, other than that, is there anything else you think are important ramifications, either positive or negative, that might have come out of something like uh, such an expose on mushrooms or focus on mushrooms? Well, you know, there's been, I guess, a confluence of things that are were happening um, when the film uh, hit Netflix. One is we were in the midst of a pandemic um, and here was a, um, there was a, a lot of messages in the film about, about wellness um, and um, how mushrooms, uh, you know, the uh, psychedelic mushrooms can, uh, are, are how impactful they can be for people suffering from certain uh, mental distress. I think that had a lot of resonance um, for audiences. Um, I think in the, uh, it, also a pandemic reality is that people, um, were a, the notion of going foraging, uh, it was really quite appealing because it, it was safe. <laughs> you could go with your pod into the woods, you know, and it was something that you didn't have to worry right. about infection. And it's also, it's kind of educational for the kids. So it, it you know, it, it was something that people of all ages in a, in a pod could, could participate in, um, so I think that um, uh, those two factors were really significant in, um, in getting people excited. But at the same time, there's been some momentum building for a while as more and more people um, mm -hmm. in the media, like myself, or, or uh, who have um, uh, produced books and um, uh, on on the subject of mushrooms, you know. Um, and it's been really been going on for a while in newspaper articles, magazine articles. And um, and and uh, and books. You, folks have been addressing these sub this subject, you know, from different angles for a while. And you know, maybe it just hit a critical mass. You know, who knows what makes a zeitgeist happen? Believe me, if I knew, <laughs> I'd be selling a lot more books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It does seem to be this super organic thing that is. You know, I often think of it quite like mushrooms, right? Where mycelium is growing in all these different ways. Eventually it all comes together and produces this beautiful fruiting body, which is a mushroom. And that almost seems to be what is happening on a broader scale with mushrooms. So, but I mean, speaking of, you know, foraging and, and fantastic fungi, you were involved in writing the fantastic fungi community cookbook, which is really cool. So I wanted to dig into that a little bit. Um, I guess you worked with 50 different authors to kind of put that together. Yeah. So Tell me a little bit more about that experience in writing that book. I'm sure that was a great way to connect with some of the wider mycological community, but I'd love to hear some of your experiences in, in writing that book. Oh yeah. That, you know, that was, that book was, it was a really fabulous um, experience. And it's, I think it's a pretty great story because, well, for me personally, it brings together two interests of mine, you know, mycology and cooking. So um, in a way it was like a, a career kind of closing the circle sort of experience. Um, what happened is in, um, I guess it was, uh, 20 is in the summer of 2020 and, uh, Lou, so we're all locked down. Right. And, uh, Louie called me up and he says, I really want to do a fantastic fungi cookbook and I want you to write it. And so his thinking originally was I would come up with all the recipes and it would be, you know, a, a mushroom cookbook. And I thought, you know, eh, you know, this, there's a variety of, um, excellent, uh, forager chef cookbooks out there. Um, and I just didn't, couldn't see how one by me would be so distinguishing, you know, I mean, maybe the people that love my cookbooks, you know, would buy it, but, eh. um, and then it, I was going to say quickly, I've, I've tried your mushroom cooking and it is delicious. <laughs> oh, thank <so>. you. <laughs> <laughs> that could have been a book, but <laughs> sorry, you. continue. Uh, well, that's kind of you to say, but for me, I just felt like it wasn't a big enough, um, that, that I wasn't big enough for the subject. And so um, it also occurred to me that, you know, Louis um, had built this uh, really big, this wonderful community uh, because the way he did, he's, the way he distributed the film at first was really by hand rather than, um, uh, it was a little bit like folks who self-publish a book. He took that film to every little bitty theater all over the country, introduced his film, got personal with people, got their email addresses and things like that. And so he really built a community and a momentum around his film, which is something that also should be said for the success of the film. I mean, once it hit Netflix, it was already loved. 
you know, by the mushroom, yep. by a lot of people in the mushroom community. So for Louie, um, he, one of his kind of guiding themes in the movie and is that um, mycelium or, you know, the, um, the mycorrhizal fungi um, in particular uh, are a metaphor for, um, uh, for how we all do better uh, when we are connected and help each other. And at a t at the time, that was, you know, when the movie first came out, that was a message that really resonated. You know, we're a divided nation. Um, and people were, and we we're all outside COVID. So people were seek really seeking community. So when I realized that about where he was coming from, I thought, wow, we can do a community cookbook. He's got the community already built into place. And it's really true to the theme, the themes that sort of motivate Louis. So I suggested that we do a community cookbook. I love community cookbooks. They're really authentic, you know, and they represent a group of people and um, their, uh, uh, their recipes that tend to be home cooking, tested over and over again, um, unpretentious. It's not like a recipe tester said, oh, I need another pizza recipe, so I'm going to come up with one today. Right. You know, it's the, there is a certain authenticity that was also mm -hmm. almost expected uh, among this community, you know, they didn't want it. I, I just don't think it, it's not a phony group. It's, these are really enthusiastic or true enthusiasts, mm -hmm. you know? And so what we did was we built a recipe sharing platform on the website, on the fantastic fungi website, encouraged people to, um, share recipes. And through that, I was able to put together a collection. Um, and there was various things that I had to keep in mind in order to make that collection work. Uh, there was often recipes that I knew would be great, but I, you know, I just couldn't have that many black trumpet recipes or, you know, there was, <laughs> there were situations and criteria I had to deal with. Um, but at the end of the day, it ended up being this incredibly personal, very emotional experience for me because I made friends with all of these authors. They all came to a, like the biggest publishing party on zoom that i think probably ever exists there were almost 50 people you know having cocktails across five time zones you know, <laughs> just meeting each other for the first time it was fabulous so um i have a very good vibe about the book and you know i personally think the recipes are delicious yeah no i looked at some of them they really really do look amazing what is it about mushrooms you think that are so special that you can make an entire cookbook about? I understand, you know, you foraged a lot of the mushrooms for this, um, which kind of adds a whole nother aspect to cooking. You know, not a lot of people go in the wild and harvest their own food. So like, you know, adding that element into, into a cookbook is, is pretty interesting. So is, is that the thing that you find most interesting about mushrooms or what is it about mushrooms that you find so interesting culinarily? Well, I think that the, um, first of all, in the, in the book, we did, I did keep in mind the problem that people wouldn't necessarily all be able to get fresh porcini. And certainly it's a seasonal, the wild product is tends if it's fresh, it's going to be seasonal, but we tested for dried versions too. So it's pretty easy to find dried porcini. You, know, you just go here, you can go online, you can go to your local Italian deli and probably find them. Um, so that said, you know, there's a, the recipes are, are are not very few of them are so particular that you that you won't be able to find adaptations. Uh, also, use cultivated in the place of um of wild. We we mention that where it's doable, which is in really most cases. Um, for me personally, as a cook, the thing that's interesting that 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 really got the, the reason why I fell in love with eating mushrooms in the first place, wild mushrooms especially, but mushrooms in general is because um, they are um, not an animal, not a plant, right? just a whole other food category <laughs> um, with other cooking um, applications, um, other flavor applications, other flavor combination applications. So it was really, um, it's, it's like, a, you know, the, the third way, culinarily speaking, you know, and, and so it was exciting. Um, it was like doing the book was great. I got turned on to all these different ways of preparing mushrooms. I didn't, you know, hadn't even crossed my mind. So, um, uh, there's a lot to, uh, to be, um, explored in the, um, in the, the sort of category of, of mushrooms. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, in a culinary sense and in a, in a broader sense, 
Um, mm-hmm. One of the things that I read in your book, I think it was in your book where I read it, where it was a stat that more people die from shark attacks than uh, yeah. mushroom poisonings, which I thought was a really interesting way to to kind of put that perspective because we do spend, you know, at Fresh Cap anyways, and I think in general, we spend a lot of time trying to promote mycophilia and in, in, in general, not the book, but the, the idea of yeah. loving mushrooms and not being afraid of mushrooms. Um, but there are still a lot of mycophobic people. And, you know, in some respect, that response is somewhat warranted. But for the most part, I think it's a little bit overdone because, you know, for the most part, people don't get sick from mushrooms and mushroom hunting and and cooking with wild mushrooms can be a pretty safe activity. Um, But not always. There are the outliers, right? And I know in your book, you talk a little bit about some of the bolder foragers. Uh, Are you aware of any kind of bad experiences with mushrooms that people have had in terms of potential mushroom poisonings and, and what that's like? Um, yeah, there's been, you know, there's, there was a, uh, um, a fellow in our club. His name was Ralph. He recently um, passed away and Ralph uh, had a, I think it was a Galerina poisoning, but I'm not sure it was before it was many years ago. Um, and he got terribly sick from it, but had enough wherewithal to bring um you know, the next day or two later to bring um, uh, Gary Linkoff back to the spot where he collected the mushrooms so they could get the samples Mm -hmm. and determine exactly what they were. He was very sick, but survived it fine. Someone, other people have done so well, like the fellow who wrote The Horse Whisperer years ago, and I reported about this in Mycophilia. He ended up having to have a kidney transplant because he um, ate, I think, again, a, a gallerina thinking it was a porcini um and then there's uh um you know there's a, 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 there's a fellow from the um new jersey club who um was a lovely um a lovely fellow and for many many years he ate morels um that he found in a um in a dying apple orchard in and somewhere in new jersey <clears throat> and he was collecting those morels every spring under those dying apple trees um, and ate him for decades. He um, died of, um, uh, I think uh, he had lead poisoning. Oh. And the while it's not known for sure, um, there is a very strong suspicion that he got his lead poisoning from eating those mushrooms all these years because the apple trees were spread with lead arsenate pesticides mm-hmm up until the 70s but you know the lead doesn't break down it's just in the soil right the the fungus is an absorptive body right so it absorbs that lead and then it goes ugh i don't want lead in me and so it pushes it into its mushroom mm-hmm. um which i've heard tom volk say is like a toilet <laughs> <laughs> it's like the fungus is toilet you know it can get rid of stuff that way um and uh and this uh, gentleman was eating the the morels and you know, it's very trace amounts of lead, but over time, it it made him it made him very sick. But you know, you can say, oh, you know, how dangerous are mushrooms? Are they really going to kill you? Well, I think there's probably berries that'll you know cause some pretty bad damage if you eat them. And but you know, you're not going to wander out in the woods and go, mm, I'm going to taste this. Berry. Right. You know, in the in the mushroom clubs, we 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 try to educate people mm-hmm. about. Uh, the poisonous mushrooms as much as the edible. There's not so many species, but those, a few of them are, are ubiquitous all over the country. So it's just good to know, know them. You can chew an, uh, you know, a, um, uh, an Amanita phylloides, which would take out your liver in a couple of days, you know, um, but you can chew it and then spit it out. It's just, it, you just can't, you know, it's just, if you metabolize it, if it gets into your liver that you're in trouble. So you know, it's safe to touch a poisonous mushroom. People think, oh, don't touch it. Don't touch it. It's okay. Just don't eat it <laughs> unless you know what it is. Yeah, exactly. And even then, you know, if it's growing in mining tailings, it could make you sick. So there's, a, there's you know, you have to think through all the factors, I guess. Yeah, no, you brought up some really good points. And I think in general, um, you know, mycophobia is, is probably overplayed, you know, you mentioned if you go into the woods and pick any random plant, be it a mushroom or be it a berry or some sort of leaf, you know, you have a similar chance. So it just, it just goes back to, you know, education being the most important part. And, um, 
you know, I think you know, that's what we're trying to do at Fresh Cap as well is just trying to teach people that, hey, you don't need to be scared of these things, but you need to be smart of these things, smart about these things. And uh, it's like anything else in life. But um, I do feel like North America in general is becoming much more mycophilic uh, than mycophobic, especially through the pandemic, as you mentioned. A, mo- a lot more people are getting interested not only in, you know, growing mushrooms at home, but also foraging mushrooms in the wild and, and learning about that. So I think that's an overall positive. One thing I wanted to dive into a little bit. So you you teach at the New York Botanical Gardens and you teach about psychedelic mushrooms uh, as, as one of your courses or psilocybin mushrooms, um, which I think is super cool. I think it's an amazing topic to teach people about and expound upon. But I wanted to hear from you, like, what is it that you're trying to get across to your students and what message are you trying to share through teaching these courses? Well, in the case of psychedelic, of the psychedelic, particularly the um, uh, the psilocybe species, the, psilo- the genus psilocybe is, um, I, I there's people have a lot of curiosity about about it right now. A lot of folks, I, always at least one of my students suffers from depression and is in the class because they wanted to learn how they were. They're curious if this is a potential avenue for relief for them. Um, those are questions that I, you know, I can't ask, but what I provide is um, uh, I provide a combination of the research to date. So it's a story I've been following for many, many years. Um, And I also like to share um, a little bit about the mycology because it can help under, it can help folks understand um, something about the mushroom and its, and its particular natures. And, and also a little bit about the neurology as it's seems to be understood. And the neurology is fascinating to me. And that seems to be for my uh, students as well, because it through, through the, the study of um, the uh, psilocybin's effect on the brain, um, it's one can come to a deeper understanding of how your, how your own brain works, you know, how you get into ruts in your thinking, um, one of the, for example, um, it was because of what I've learned about basic, I'm talking about very basic neurology, um, through, uh, through my interest in, um, the psilocybes has led me to make a little tiny realization about, uh, about COVID mm-hmm. may, this is just hypothetical, right? But and we had a super spreader event at our family gathering at Christmas and, uh, most of us, like 75% of us were, um, came down with what we assume is the Omicron v- a variety, very, um, very low grade, uh, symptoms, one of which was a kind of brain fog and brain fog is one of those phrases where you hear it and you're like, I don't really know what is that. You mean like when you wake up in the morning, you ha- have a hangover, <laughs> you know, what is brain fog? Right. Well, I'm beginning to like understand it in my own way. Um, because in the, um, in my class on um, uh, on psilocybin, uh, we talk about the default mode network, which is the part of your brain. It's actually down. It's thought to be down regulated by uh, by when you take uh, the magic mushroom or you take psilocybin. So it down regulate regulates this very large um, and connected network um, in the brain called the default mode network, and its job is to um, it's the part of your brain that's kind of always busy. So I like to to describe it this way. It's like if during this conversation, um, you suddenly go, oh, I got to get lemons, <laughs> you know, how <laughs> right. stuff like that pops into your mind. That's thought to be the, the default mode network. It's really important to everyday survival. It's like the part of you that's always working. But um, I found with Omicron that that part of my brain was like not really <laughs> functioning as well. That sort of executive functioning side of the brain, that part of the brain that's, I, I wasn't able to remember to get the lemons. And even though that has, the Omicron has nothing to do with psilocybin, it's a lesson about the brain that I learned from studying psilocybin that applied to something that had happened to me recently in regards to my own health. So I think that the takeaway from studying really anything in nature, but it's particularly this subject, um, is how much you can apply uh, to your day-to-day life under various circumstances. And that's what I try to, um, that's like the kind of very simple tool that I try to share with my students. 
That's so cool. And I love that analogy you made. And it just kind of reminds me of you know, how little we still know about all of these things. I mean, we have various mental models for how these things work. But I mean, human physiology and specifically the brain is intensely complicated. And to try and put the, you know, any type of psilocybin experience in a box where we can just define it easily with, with science it becomes very, very difficult. You know, and that's one of the most challenging things of, about psilocybin or the mushroom experience. But it's also one of the most interesting aspects of the, the mushroom experience. And um, I do notice that the narrative around psilocybin is shifting immensely. Um, you're seeing, you know, new articles every day, you know, again, fantastic fungi, obviously dove into this a lot and kind of put a different aspect or a different side of the debate. Um, so the, the narrative, the public narrative around magic mushrooms, and I use air quotes, is is really changing. But I'm just wondering too, like, have you ever experienced any pushback or negativity or, or potential misunderstandings in the broader public regarding this topic? And and if so, how how have you been able to kind of deal with that? Um, I really have not. I mean, I'm not in the business of making any claims. So, right. you know, I don't have a um, a dog in that fight. Like, I don't have claims about, I, I'm, I'm not selling anything. So right. <laughs> I just report on what the research says. If people disagree with it, you know, that's their business. I once, uh, I did write many, many years ago, I wrote an editorial in the New York Times because a new paper had come out that was um, really significant, uh, about, uh, uh psilocybin and, and, uh, magic mushrooms. So I wrote the editorials of trying to encourage more people to, to open their minds and allow this, re you know, and embrace this research. Let's see more of it. It can help people. It could help people. And the only pushback, and I got hundreds of emails and Twitters and things like that. And, um, uh, the only pushback I got was not actually pushback, but was just really important to hear. And that is um, folks that have a, um, a, a, a family history of schizophrenia mm -hmm. have to be very careful taking these drugs because it can be a trigger. So, you know, you don't have symptoms, but you have the gene, then, you know, this is not the drug for you. Uh, and the thing about the research is that where things are at right now is that um, uh, those kind of uh, disorders are, um, they're filtered out of the um, trials, right? So people who have the, um, who have schizophrenia in their family, they don't go, they don't participate right. in the trials. So once <clears throat> psilocybin becomes a, once and when and if it becomes a widely prescribed medication, <clears throat> then we're going to really see, you know, when millions of people are taking it, um, what the, um, you know, what the fallout's going to be for a variety of who knows what kind of, you know, as you say, the brain is very complicated, um, and so are genes. So, uh, so that still remains to be played out. And it was important to get that, um, feedback from, uh, it was actually a pediatrician who sent me this email and, um, because it made me make sure you know, that I paid attention to that aspect of the story. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a really good point. Because, you know, although these things have been around for a long time and been used for a long time, you know, the, the science is still relatively new. Um, and in a lot of ways, we feel like, yeah, we know what the results are going to be of these studies and these experiments because it's been around for a long time. But at the same time, uh, maybe we don't, maybe there still is a lot yeah. that we don't know. So it's interesting and important, I think, to have a broader perspective. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a pretty good point to bring up. Okay. I have a couple of rapid fire questions for you. Oh, um, first of all, this might be hard. I could never answer this question myself, but what's your favorite mushroom? Huh. Well, <clears throat> I guess I have two answers for that. One is my favorite mushroom is whichever one, like I'm collecting at the time. You know, because I I get very very excited and very um uh th very thrilled with them, and I'm like, no, this is the best mushroom. And then tomorrow I might find another species. No, this is the best mushroom. But I suppose my favorite mushroom is it, this is a weird thing, but a lot of uh, it's not uncommon for mushroom hunters to dream about um, finding mushrooms. It's a kind of ecstatic dream. Um, so I have a recurring dream, and it is so ecstatic. I mean, it's really closer to a wet dream than it is to anything else <laughs> where I'm looking for and find these grotesque 
oversized morels growing underneath the shrubbery in abandoned foreign uh, abandoned uh, formal gardens. That's awesome. <laughs> so weird. It's so weird. And it's so great. <laughs> it's like if I have that dream at night and I wake up in the morning, I just feel so good. That's so funny. I wonder if that's a, a normal thing for mushroom lovers because I get that dream too, where I'm like walking through and I see like mushrooms growing everywhere and it's so exciting and um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to dig into that. See if that's a more common yeah. thing. <laughs> it is. It is. I just the other day was talking to somebody. And she goes, oh, I always dream about these mushrooms growing in the corners of the house. <laughs> you know, they're growing like out of the corners of the house. And, uh, and it's exciting for her, even though it's also about decay. <laughs> Right. Double meaning there. Um, okay. Real quick. And I think you already answered this question because I've been talking to you, but do you say fungi, fungi, or fungi? So I say fungi. Um, and uh, I recently, well, a couple of months ago, I got an email through my um, website. You know, I have a website, eugeniabone.com. And, and somebody sent me an email saying that I should be um, killed and my head chopped off and all of these very violent imagery because I said fungi and it's not, that was incorrect. And I was like, what? Um, so I, I reached out to a few friends. Um, one of them was Paul Stamets. And I was like, what gives? Are you having this experience too? And, um, and Paul was really fantastic. He, uh, he said, you know, I say fungi because that's what my teachers said. And I was like, same here that, you know, my teachers all, you know, Gary Linkoff and Tom Volk, they said fungi. So that's why I say fungi. There isn't really, I don't think that fungi, 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 is, I don't think that anyone is correct because it's, I don't know, derived from Latin or something, who knows, but um, follow what, uh, what I do is I follow up my teacher, uh, my, my teachers, the, my, the pronunciation of my teachers. I agree. And I've always said fungi as well. I don't know why. And to be honest, it probably is because of Paul Stamets listening to him say it. And just that's the way I said it. But yeah, in general, Latin names uh, and scientific names and fungi. I mean, I don't think there is a proper English pronunciation. So I just let people go. There. I just ask you because it's funny because we do. I've done a few polls with people and it seems like fungi is the clear winner for whatever reason. And yeah, I take a lot of heat for saying fungi as well. So I haven't got an email quite like you described, but you yeah, know, close enough. they don't want to chop off your head. Well, Not quite good. for other reasons. That was maybe. really so. That was so. That was just pretty weird. But yeah, I don't think it matters. Just say it. Just <laughs> Better say it. Say it. <laughs> One other question for you is: What's next on your agenda? I know you know you're always doing a lot of things in mushrooms, whether it be writing books or or being fantastic fungi or being in um, that mochi and I forget the name of the oh, kids yeah, show, yeah, but yeah. like that was. Waffles that was and really mochi. cool. Yeah, that's Waffles a wonderful mochi, show. That was it. All those episodes are so great. If you have kids, it's a really uh, great show to watch. It's um, Michelle Obama's Higher Ground Productions, and it's just really smart and well done. And it's like Sesame Street meets the Food Channel. It's really good. Yeah. Um, I was proud to be a part of it. And no, I didn't meet Michelle Obama. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, they just filmed me in my living room. Yeah. So what's next? Well, usually what I do, and it kind of frustrates my publishers and agent and stuff like that, but... I tend to go back and forth between a cookbook and um, like a, a, a reading book. Mm -hmm. um, it's just sort of, you know, my, I'll do recipes for a couple of years and then kind of need a break from that. In the meantime, I'm reading other stuff and thinking about a new idea. So I just did a cookbook and now I'm, um, I'm in the early stages of thinking about a new reading book. Um, I'm staying in my wheelhouse um, in that I'm, uh, looking at, um, like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag at this point, Where? but I'm looking into another, um, uh, I'm looking into microbes again, both fungal and bacterial. Very interesting. Makes sense. A lot more people are thinking about that nowadays. So, uh, the hidden world, uh, around us it's really cool uh, i i hope you know that you, you just don't know about the zeitgeist i gotta say i'm one of these writers that i just i just keep falling down my own <laughs> wormholes and sometimes there's the it sometimes it resonates with people and sometimes they don't but you know i don't know what else i don't know how that's else it to do it. you gotta follow your passion absolutely yeah. and um so far, I think a lot of people have really appreciated that. So, you know, for example, going down the rabbit hole on mushrooms, 
I know like, you know, I was reading through a lot of the reviews for your book as well. And a lot of people said, wow, you know, I didn't know there was, you could write, you know, a couple hundred pages about mushrooms. I had no idea. <laughs> and, you know, I think once you, once you dig into it, you realize there's so much more to the world around us and you can take any subject like mushrooms and keep going down the rabbit hole. I've been going down the rabbit hole basically my whole life and I'm still super interested in it, which is why, you know, I love, I love to talk to, to people like you and, and do the things that we're doing. So is there anything that you want to talk about that you want to tell the wider mushroom community that we didn't cover yet on this show? Oh yeah. Here's something I would encourage your um, listeners and watchers uh, to go to the NAMA North American Mycological Association website. I think it's N a m y c dot org and look under clubs where all of the um uh, mycological societies and associations all over the country and uh and canada of course um are um you know what the, the contact in information is and where they are there's there's mushroom clubs all over um i believe almost every state um, has a, has at least one and many have multiple if they're in like that temperate zone where there's water. Um, that's the way to learn about uh, foraging mushrooms, in my opinion. It's really a peer-to-peer -peer learning experience. I mean, you can use books and there's a lot of great ones, especially if you use a regional book. But um, learning from somebody who knows, going into the woods, seeing those mushrooms in their habitat, in your habitat, um, seeing them young, seeing them old, seeing the mushrooms beaten up by weather, seeing them um, uh, splitting from uh, f from heat, all those things uh, you need the, it, those all those things can be only pointed out um, in person. And the way you get that in person experience is by joining your local mycological club and hooking up with the forays and making friends and getting out in the woods. That is such amazing advice. And you're so right. You know, you can spend, you know, years looking at books and being confused, or you can just go with your local mycological society, get together with some experts that can actually point to things. Have you feel it? Have you smell it, taste yeah. it or whatever, and really understand mushrooms. And yeah. at the same time, you know, meet some great people and some great friends and build community. That's, I couldn't agree with you more. I joined our local mycological society not that long ago, actually, and it really leveled up and it made me think like, wow, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on just around me that I never would have thought existed yeah. until I met up with those people. So I'm really glad you mentioned that. If people want to learn more about, about you, about your books, where's the best place to connect with, with Eugenia Bone? Well, I'm, um, I have a website that I try to keep fresh. Um, so that's eugeniabone.com. And then I have an Instagram account, which I, I mainly focus on food on that, but sometimes I, I put links to things that I, I think are particularly interesting. So those are probably, and then if you, you know, I, on Facebook, but well, that's a private group, but if you friend me, um, that's where I put up scientific papers that I think are really fascinating. Like one just came out and I put it up there and it's, it's, this paper talks about how, all right, pathogenic myco, um, biota. So little tiny fungi, um, that genetically ancestral mycobiota, uh, uh, biota, um, that attached to plant roots, um, have, uh, they're now, um, uh, that are now gone. Their genes have, are now, are appearing in mutualists. So the genes that mutualists, um, that are attached to the roots of, um, a wide variety of trees, um, that the genes that allow the plant, the, 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 um, uh, mutualists, the mycorrhizal fungi, these are ectomycorrhizae, the genes that allow them to attach to plants um, are actually of pathogenic fungi origin. Wow. Right? That's like mind blowing <laughs> yeah. to me. You know, the pathogens, the, the pathogenic gene, the, the genes that work for the pathogenicity um, is what's making the mutualism work today. There's a metaphor in there somewhere. I really think there is. And that is something that's endlessly fascinating to me is, the, yeah, the relationships that mushrooms play with other plants and other mushrooms and, you know, mycorrhizal fungi. 
Um, we were doing some research on a video about the, the Spun Network, which is um, the Society for the Protection of Underground Networks. And they're basically trying to map out all of the fungal networks oh, yeah. across the world so yeah. we can protect them, which I think is a really cool idea. Yeah. But in that video, I learned about a mycorrhizal fungus that like moves phosphorus around to specific areas where it's lacking so that it can demand a higher price from the trees. Oh, so, yeah. Like, mycorrhizal That's like Toby fungi, Keir's yeah. work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So cool, like almost yeah. acting like extreme like capitalists in a way, but it's just like, yeah. how, like just how are mushrooms doing this? How are they figuring this out? Um, and yeah, like the paper you mentioned as well, it's kind of like an endlessly fascinating topic. Yeah, the, the more the more research that comes out, the 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 more complicated the relationships get. <laughs> it's beautiful, isn't that so true? Yeah, the more we know, the less we know in a way. So <laughs> yeah, or as one fellow who I've been corresponding with on Instagram said, "Wow." life in life <laughs> <laughs> absolutely the life in life absolutely well eugenia i want to say thank you so much for joining us on the mushroom show this is the inaugural episode of the mushroom show so oh, i'm super out. happy to have you on um and yeah we'll put all the links to some of the stuff we talked about in the show notes or in the description links to to you and your book as well so once again thank you so much for being on the show my pleasure thanks for having me tony best of luck with the show i'm sure it's going to be fabulously successful and interesting and all the things that we look for. Awesome. We're really excited about it too. So thanks again.